So lately, uh, I mean, it's hard to do anything in a pandemic, um, really hard to make comics. Um, I also have an 18 month old kid. So parenting and making comics in a pandemic is kind of impossible. Um, I get like two hours to myself every night where sometimes I draw and sometimes, sometimes I, I get to do a talk with fun people. Uh, and sometimes I just like, I'm sad and I eat pie <laughs> and don't do anything else. Um, like, but like two or three years ago, I made it a goal to find an agent. Um, and I'm now represented by Susan Hawk and that's been uh, wonderful and also a huge learning curve of how the, the real book industry works and not just self-publishing and the crazy indie world of comics. Um, so we've been trading uh, pitches back and forth for, I guess, about 18 months now. <laughs> um, so that's that's what I've been working on, just just trying to get um, get a pitch ready and refine it and so that she can take it and hopefully sell a book. Uh, so there's two that we're working on. One is my passion projects, which is a uh, Russian fairy tale, lesbian witches fight Baba Yaga. And then the other one is, oh, yay, I like to hear that. <laughs> um, the other one is a weird memoir where I had an 18 year old, or not 18 year old, an eight year old reader um, write me and wanted to know why I always had short hair. Um, which isn't a problem right now, but I, I had to kind of go like, well, why would a little girl ask why I have short hair? Why is that a big deal? Like, oh yeah, this whole gender thing where it's like boys are supposed to have short hair and girls have long hair. And so let's do a book about that and why that's kind of weird. Um, so that's, that's the other comic I'm working on. And we'll, we'll see what works. My gigantic project is my big writing project. It's actually, um, it's four books. Um, they're just words, although I did also write like a, what I think might be a web comic for it. It's Mother Mountain. It's kind of a LGBTQ, et cetera, YA book in this exotic world that I've been writing since like the 90s. And um, um, I thought I would never like live to get this giant project done because I've had like day jobs for like 10 years, you know, and so forth. But, but with the pandemic, I can like stay, I mean, I'm not working at the theater anymore because there's no shows ever, you know, they're not going to have the ballet probably until next year sometime. So I have lots of time to write and there's a bunch of other shits happened. <laughs> like um, my mom just died and, you know, we're oh, dealing right. with that. Oh yeah. I mean, that stuff happens, but I am like writing, writing. Then there's um, also a couple of other projects. Like I was talking to a small publisher, Northwest Press, about maybe like a collection of all this stuff I've done that nobody's, almost nobody's seen all my LGBT comics from like the 70s and eight, all my stuff from gay comics, which, no, I mean, you know, like stuff I was doing when nobody else was doing it. And then also fanographics. Um, we've been talking about like a big bitchy book, like, the best of bitchy or something. And I'd like to finish this little bitchy. It's like a three issue, one of my sort of three issue bitchy graphic novels where she's, you know, dealing with her health. And she's at the end of the series, she was worried she had breast cancer and she was being paranoid. So this is kind of like about health paranoia. So I'd like to have that in there also. And, um, I don't know. I mean, everything's kind of pushed back now because of the pandemic. So I've kind of let everything else slide and I'm just doing the writing and the writing is cool. It's like the YA book I, I would have loved to have seen like, uh, you know, 50 years ago when I was a YA, you know, so I'm ex I have no clue if anybody's going to publish it or if I'll just put it up online for free. I just want to get the damn thing done. It's like, Three so far, it's like three hundred and thirty thousand word novels, which are like fat little novels. And but when when I finish this one in a few weeks, I'll have one more to go. So I am enthused about that, rather than you know upset that I will never live to get this done because I'm not young anymore. So 
that's kind of it. Plus there's lots of other stuff too, but I mean, with me, there's always gonna be other stuff. I mean, there's projects I'm probably just never gonna live to do, but you guys won't know about it, so. My cat has appeared. Ooh. Everybody, this is Sophia. Oh. So that's me. Right. It's so easy. You don't have to draw anything. You just, just like, you know, you can have these scenes that would take you years to draw and you just describe it. Wonderful. I love it. That almost seems like cheating. Yeah. yeah, you just just push push words around until they're in the right place. You don't have to like draw and plot and, you know, do all the hard work it is to do like, you know, comics. So it's a piece of cake. I mean, it's fun. <laughs> Well, you know, syndicated cartooning is a harsh mistress, and yeah, I have to have the strips there every day, even though there's a pandemic going on, my job sucks. So there's that. I mean, day to day, my life isn't that different than it was before lockdown. Like, I'm at my house drawing comics, and I, before I could, like, go to restaurants and stuff, so there was that. I used to like to write uh, the strip in coffee shops and stuff, which is less of a possibility now than it was but you know the strip continues i have i have a couple things coming out um actually this week this this picture book that i illustrated uh called i met a girl is coming out because this is out on tuesday and it is a story it's uh sort of sort of an autobiographical story written by a young uh transgender boy who's he's 13 years old now Maddox Lyons and this is his story about convincing his parents of his real gender and they asked me if I'd illustrate it and I, uh, my lawyer told me not to do it because he's like you already have too much work stop saying yes to everything but this was when yeah he, he had no ideological objection he was just like you you gotta stop taking so much work but uh this was what I really wanted to do. And that comes out on Tuesday. It was going to come out in May, but then the pandemic happened. And I kind of hope this finds its way into a lot of hands. I, I hope that the pandemic doesn't like stop it from getting its due because it's a story that deserves some attention. And then I have in uh, September, I have Phoebe and Your Unicorn Book 12 coming out, which I have right here. I, I have, I have, Two copies. I had three, but I gave one to my niece. <laughs> and yeah, that's uh, that's my life right now. I don't know where the magic comes from, and every day I live in mortal terror that it will run out. Yeah. Yeah, I've been doing this. I've been doing this strip now since 2012, and I get at this point I get like two weeks of reruns a year, which we were going to use to go to New Zealand, but New Zealand's not letting Americans into the country now. So I guess we'll go to New Zealand some other time. But I've, other than that, two weeks I like I've been doing this, just really tr cranking out this strip every day since 2012. Yeah, this is, this is the job. Constant deadlines. It's reliable. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
it's been really different for every single project um, that when I do my personal stuff, um, I just kind of dive in and start working, um, which is why it often doesn't make any sense. And then I just say it's artsy. Uh, but then now trying to work more professionally, I've had to do outlines and had to thumbnail the whole book first. And then people go out and they tell me the parts that don't make sense and I can fix them ahead of time, which is really handy. Um, so it's constantly evolving. <laughs> Uh, well, if I have a project like a drawn project like comics, um, what I normally do, I usually like wait a long time because everything has to kind of mix around. Like I'm supposed to do like a page for an anthology that I'm way behind on that I have no ideas for, but because the one I had, they one idea I had, they didn't like. But I know it's in there somewhere. And then, and like when I was cranking out like 40 issues of Naughty Bits, I just sort of have enough, you know, oh, but you've been on vacation and na 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 have my day job and so forth. And then I would just sit down and just write the whole thing in about 12 hours. I mean, you know, a um, 60 page comic strip. I mean, way too much. I mean, I write way too much. And then as I sit down and just start drawing it, I don't do thumbnails, I just draw, I kind of start cutting out things that, you know, are redundant and so forth. And it kind of works. So, but I do, I kind of do all the writing even more writing than I need for it first and then kind of weed out as I go along. I don't just, you know, see where it'll take me. I have, I have to think of ideas constantly because it, this job has to get done every single day. So one thing I do is I have an idea file on my phone where you know i'll just be walking around during the day and i'll think of stuff or someone will say something to me people in my life are very helpful like my spouse will be like so has marigold ever done this has marigold ever gone to a music festival or whatever which by the way she has not you just watched me have an idea this is my process marigold goes to winnicott music festival god that's <laughs> great i gotta use that um write it down remind me i said that um, so that's that's the sort of thing, and I just I write these down in my idea file, and sometimes they sit there for months or years, and then um, uh, when I don't have anything, I will scroll through the file and be like, oh, I haven't done that. Maybe that'll that'll be my script for this week. And I'll write a story about something from the file. Um, I usually. I don't plan the story arcs out too much because they're not long enough to really need planning out. I just sort of write them. It's different when it's one of the graphic novels. Like a couple of the Phoebe books are graphic novels with longer stories and those I had to figure out how to like write a story outline and you know, plan it a little more carefully. But with the strip itself, I don't really plan ahead that much. I just start writing. My cat has brought her favorite toy into the room and would like me to know that she's a mighty hunter. <laughs> she's chasing it around the floor. It's actually very distracting. Not me. I am. <laughs> I'd like to learn digital someday, but. I went Any all digital. Help me. Need help. <laughs> I went all digital in 2007. Hmm. When I got I got my first was it Wacom or Wacom? I always I've always said Wacom and people told me recently that's wrong and it's Wacom. I think it's Wacom. I think I've been I think I said it wrong for the first 12 years that I was using one. Um but yeah, I have a drawing tablet and I Phoebe is an entirely digital creation. Uh, the strip I did before that, Ozzy and Millie, was it was a web strip, but I drew it on paper. And then I got my first tablet in 2007, and I always get I was seduced by the allure of the undo function because it, yeah, because suddenly I didn't need whiteout, and I didn't need to make hard decisions like, is that good enough? That has to be good enough because I already inked it, uh, and I don't want to fuss with it. And now it's just like I can try something, and if it doesn't work, I just hit undo. 
And if I look at it and I'm like, that should be slightly to the left, or that should be like 10% bigger or smaller, then I can do all that. And I think it's made me a better artist. And also piles of artwork aren't accumulating in my house anymore, which is, that that has its, yeah. It's still, still have boxes and boxes of Ozzy and Millie originals because I drew all those on paper. But Phoebe just all exists on the digital media. And as long as I back it up, I don't have to worry about anything. I really want to learn to be better at technology. I actually bought this iPad um, because a friend, Nomi Kane, got an iPad and suddenly her work became um, so much crisper and she was so much more prolific. And I was like, I want to be like Nomi. Um, but then I tried all these programs and I, I've been using Photoshop since 2002 and I just look at them and go, this isn't Photoshop. I don't, my brain doesn't understand how it works. Um, I need, a, I need a teacher and, and with, that's hard with the pandemic because um, I tried some digital classes uh, back when I was first in college, couldn't, couldn't do it. Um, I need a teacher in a classroom. So someday when there's a vaccine, I will figure out how to use this iPad that I spent so much money on. Yeah, I use my iPad for, I, I haven't done a lot of finished work that I've actually like handed in for publication on my iPad. Most of that's on my desktop, but I do like all of my roughs on my iPad, my Apple Pencil, and sketch it out. And it's so easy because then I can just like do it and then email this to my editor so she can tell me all the reasons it's bad. Yeah, right now I'm I'm childcare for most of the day, um, and then I just get that little window in the evening. Um, so during that window, I have to be creative. I have to want to work, <laughs> um, and then sometimes I just don't. And you some you know that the, you have to give yourself you have to be kind to yourself and give yourself permission to have an off day. Um, but then when there's a deadline, either a real one or a self-imposed deadline. You just got to pay attention to that as well. Yeah, like I said, it's not really that different now than it was before the pandemic. I'm still responsible for getting my scripts in by a certain time. And I have deadlines for stuff, like, like bigger projects. Um, but it's sort of my day-to-day -day time management is my responsibility. I'm not great at it, but I'm better than I used to be. And stuff gets done. I sort of tether myself to my spouse's schedule in a lot of ways. Like if, it, if I weren't married to somebody who has to get up and do like a real person job, I would probably stay up till like two or three and then sleep till noon or whatever. And I've, I'm glad that I'm not doing that. I feel like it's a good thing that I have this sort of link to normal people life. And it, it, it helps with time management. Time management is a little arbitrary when you, you working from home on something that you get to set your own hours on. So it's nice having some, you know, arbitrary outside limitations placed on you. Yeah, my time management's pretty deadline oriented. I've got something with the deadline. I, you know, make it work. Otherwise, like I'm working on some big project. I don't know if anybody's ever going to publish it. So I can <laughs> do whatever. Yeah. Plus, I mean, things are really weird now. I mean, there's just a lot of things going on. So it's kind of hard to, it's not normal. I don't have a normal schedule anymore.
Cliff, you can ask if Roberta could go first because you've been doing this the longest, I think. So what? I'm not sure if I really feel like I've been that part, much a part of the industry. I mean, I was in the like underground comics, some of the underground comics and the, or the late wave of them and um, places that specifically like Lynn, Lynn Chibley and Joyce Farmer's publications. I mean, they're looking for things for women. So being a woman in that case was an asset and being like one of the few females in gay comics during the eighties when Howard Cruz wanted um, even pages by even amount of pages by men and women. That was kind of an asset too, because I was about the only woman really doing LGBT comics in 1980. And um, oh, let's see, like, I mean, to be somebody that's really in the industry, like Colleen Duran. I mean, she would definitely have different stories and different experiences than me. Then I've just kind of like I had my 40 issue series with Fanographics during the 90s, which. I mean, to me, that was really kind of a, when you really saw a lot of other women doing comics, that was very impressive. And um, yeah, now, like I say, I don't, I feel like I'm kind of watching the industry from a distance. I don't feel that much involved in it, but um, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I never felt terribly oppressed or anything. I mean, I mean, I mean, there wasn't that much of an interest in my comics, and um, but I don't know if that's just the content or that I was female or that I'm just doing the kind of weird shit I want to read that maybe nobody else wants to read. But yeah, so um, yeah, like I say, I've never I've never really felt like part of the industry. I've just felt like this person that just kind of does my little weird stories, and if I'm lucky, I can find somebody that wants to publish them, and if not, I just kind of do them myself. So, um, yeah, I've always kind of felt like an outsider. I just, I've just been doing shit I want, stuff I want to read, you know, you're going to have to believe me. So, I, yeah, I just kind of do what I want to read that nobody else is doing. And I say, if I'm lucky, somebody else will want to publish it. So. Um, yeah, um, I don't know, it's, I feel like I keep having deja vu with the comic industry, like, the predators who are getting outed right now and are supposedly facing consequences, I felt like we already did all that with these same people five years ago. Um. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> that is weird. And it's, a, yeah, the same thing keeps happening over and over again. Um. In, there's another cartoonist who lives in my building, um, Tatiana Gill, and we were having a talk, walking a few days ago, talking about how we've both had one person who was um, kind of our, our big bad, you know, harasser in comics. And for both of us, that person doesn't work in comics anymore, so I'm not going to say anything. But if they ever try to come back in, I guess I have to say something. Um, so yeah, being a woman in comics is weird. It's also really great to be like behind a table at a convention and people bring up, bring their, their kids and they say, oh, look, you could, you could do this when you, when you grow up, you could make comics. And uh, do you want to buy this comic? Because there's a girl on the cover and that's, that's just amazing. Um, so yeah, there, there's definitely uh, good sides and bad sides to it. So recently, uh, like just in the past week, I was on a Zoom call with a bunch of people from my publisher, publisher slash syndicate, Andrews McNeil Universal. And uh, this was because Jan Elliott has uh, retired from doing her comic strip Stone Soup, which she did for 25 years. It was a long time. And uh, I got on the call because Jan has been kind of a 
She was kind of a mentor for me in the very beginning. Um, like when when I got my development contract, I won it in a contest back in two thousand in late two thousand nine. And uh, as soon as that happened, like one of the first e emails I got was from John Elliott, who I didn't know personally at all at that point. Um, who was just like, hey, so you're you've got this development deal now. Congratulations. Let me know if you need any help with it. And she she told me later, oh, I email all the girls. And so, yeah, during the during the development period, which was like a year and a half, we were developing what would become Phoebe and her unicorn eventually. And it was a frustrating, slow process. Um, the strip that we ended up launching was kind of different than the strip that we started with. And I think that's a good thing. I think we used the time really well. And I'm really happy with what we came up with. But it was scary at the time. Like, I've got this opportunity I've wanted my entire life. And am I going to blow it? And I think I came very close to blowing it, but Jan was always there being, holding my hand and being like, nah, uh, you'll, you'll be fine. Hang in there. What's happening is normal. And she told me that when she first started out in comics, Lynn Johnston, for better or for worse, had played that role for her um, and sort of held her hand through development. And then I had the opportunity a few years later when my friend Georgia Dunn had her strip Breaking Cat News picked up for syndication. I was sort of there to be the Jan Elliott for her and sort of, so I sort of see myself as part of a, as a link in this chain of, of, of girl syndicated cartoonists who have all kind of had each other's backs. And I like that. Like we are kind of a minority still. I, I don't think syndicated cartooning lacks women, but it's historically a very male occupation. That's changing a lot. We have a lot more, a lot more women, a lot more people of color. I have the distinction of having been the first transgender person ever to be a, be a syndicated cartoonist. And I'm pleased to say I am no longer the only one. We're multiplying uh, comics. Comic strips are getting so much more diverse. Um, and that, that makes me happy. And I, I feel like we do kind of have each other's backs and we're, we're diversifying this occupation. That's awesome. All right. Um, well, I guess I'm kind of curious about this. Um, what do you guys think about sort of uh, networking or would you have any advice for networking? Well, I guess especially now um, as far as, you know, uh, Things are more, yeah, we can't do conventions and whatnot. And uh, sort of, well, there, I guess there's all this big talk about um, sort of the, the, the bar con after the con, you know, if, uh, uh, and things like that, and uh, leads to a lot of these uh, sort of uh, opportunities for uh, misogyny and stuff. Um, so yeah, I guess, uh, what do you guys think about that? Or uh, what, do you, what do you guys think about when you, um, or if you even try to do networking or, uh, you know, how do you, uh, what do you do for meeting people and stuff? So, yeah. I don't think I network at all anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've, I've already got the job I want. All I have to do is not say anything that gets me fired from it. Oh. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, yeah, how about you, uh, Roberta? Really or do, you, yeah. do you do a lot of that uh, uh, networking and things like that? Or, you know, I saw you did a big panel at uh, uh, last last time there was a uh, live uh, Emerald City Comic Con, or when you could actually visit, but yeah. <laughs> what? Oh, uh, I was saying, well, how do you do networking? Or do you do a lot of networking, especially when you do like conventions like Emerald City? Oh, no. no <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, usually, I mean, I've, I've never gone to a bar con. I mean, by the time I'm sitting at a table, I am so fried after being here all day. I usually just go back to my hotel and go to bed. So I am. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, I've always, I'm always amazed by people that can like spend a whole day behind a table and then go out drinking and partying with other people and, and networking it up. Because after yeah. a whole day being behind a table, I kind of just want to be somewhere quiet. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a mess. I mean, I just think if I go out, I'm just going to do more damage than <laughs> do more damage than good, you know, if I'm going to be in public after spending the day having people walk past my table and make faces at me. Or whatever. So yeah, uh, I don't know. I wish I mean, I love the concept of networking. I mean, there's a lot I mean, there's a lot of things I really could use some help with like tech and everything. But we've, I don't know, we've been trying to get help for years and people 
you know, like kind of volunteer and then disappear and stuff. So I don't know. So I think I'm just, I'm just meant to write. And then once I get this, I actually have the laptop right here with my massive novel. Once I get it done, I will just, you know, one step at a time. I mean, I think the, what I've learned in life is just get your little project done and then go on. Don't, I am not a multitasker. <laughs> hmm. I've actually been writing while, you know, I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> How about you, Colleen? Do you do, do you do a lot of that stuff or, yeah. So when I do conventions, um, it, I don't, it's, I feel more like everyone is a little family reunion where I want to see my friends and meet my, see my comics family again. Um, the best advice I've ever been given about BarCon was Carol Tyler said to go to the bartender and order um, just a plain soda with a twist of lemon so that, because I'm, I'm not a drinker, <laughs> but you can look like you're drinking and then people don't bother you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Most of my networking is really done on Twitter. Um, Twitter has been amazing. Before Twitter, I mean, I because I, I, I grew up on an island in the middle of nowhere, so I made friends on LiveJournal and MySpace. Um, there, there weren't people around me in real life, so I had to make digital friends. Um, but it's been great to every now and then um, just sort of tweet out, I want to make a comic about this, and sometimes somebody responds and they're like, I'd like to publish that comic. And that's amazing. Uh, so yeah, use, use Twitter, learn the hashtags. There's this whole system for a thing called PitMad, um, which is very complicated, but it's, it seems to be worth learning. <laughs> what is that? Um, I can't figure out if it happens once a year or a few times a year, but people will sort of tweet out their book pitches and publishers and editors and agents are paying attention and they're looking through the hashtags for ideas they uh. like. Uh, Google it because I don't think I'm describe describing <laughs> it well. Um, when I worked at it? A, it, it was like Pip Mad or? Yeah, so I guess it's Pitch Madness is the oh, long pitch version. Oh, gotcha. um, Pitch Madness, gotcha. Yeah, when I worked at the library, my uh, my library boss, um, Melanie, oh God, my brain, because I don't sleep anymore. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, she, she was a science fiction fantasy writer, so she taught me a lot about um, about pitching and, and using Twitter effectively to network. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I been... think... <laughs> oh, go for it. Go ahead. Oh, that was it. I just remembered my boss's name. I'm sure. because I'm, <laughs> I have a toddler. I've just been uh, using Twitter more. Well, just because, you know, it seems like more reliable than the real news uh, in a lot of cases. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I've been, uh, yeah, kind of enjoying it a little bit more. Um, yeah. I resolved that I was going to just start having more fun with Twitter. Like, I started earlier this year, kind of at the beginning of the pandemic, actually. I started curating my Twitter experience so that I'd be less angry and have more fun. <laughs> and I don't really tweet about stuff that's too serious a lot of the time, just like stuff about unicorns and pictures of my cat. Yeah. That's what they're all there for. Promote <laughs> stuff that's coming out, but like, yeah, I'm not there to argue. I, I used to be online to argue back in the day. I'm done doing that. <laughs> yeah, it can be, be, yeah, talking to uh, uh, wall yeah uh, <laughs> um let's see well i think um yeah maybe we'll start to um just talk about uh, what you guys would like to plug and we'll kind of wrap it up and everything um yeah um yeah any well uh you know i think we probably mentioned before but uh yeah go ahead and uh, mention it again in case uh, you know they missed the first part uh so um yeah go ahead uh colleen uh yeah what uh what are your uh latest releases, which, uh, and uh, you can do many orders for graphic novels at Destiny City Comics, and you can just email ethanhd at destinycitycomics.com for that. Uh, but yeah, let's go ahead with uh, Colleen, yeah. Cool, um, so my pal here, I'll start with the heaviest thing. Um, I got a piece of fan art in the Chronicles of Exandria, Ooh. and I'm just excited about this, because for such a long time, um, guys, men specifically told me not to draw fan art. Um, but I kept seeing huh. guys draw fan art and being successful. 
Um, so it's just so fun to like draw fan art and have fun and enjoy things and that it ends up in a book. And yes. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> Ladies, draw fan art uh, if you like to, if it makes you happy. Um, and then let's do see. It. Absolutely do it. I went through a phase of drawing a lot of my little pony fan art and I actually had to turn down a, an offer to write for the comics a few years ago because oh, wow. I was too busy. That's great. <laughs> Um, and then let's see, uh, Prison Island came out in 2015, but um, I think it either just turned out it, it's advanced or is about to. So if you buy it now, I might see a royalty check. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, and you can, uh, Mike at Destiny, when you were at Destiny City Comics, um, you did so much for this book. Thank you so much again. Oh, no <laughs> problem. Were... It was really cool to have, yeah, local interest, uh, especially graphic memoir uh, for younger readers and stuff. Yeah, it's an amazing book. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think it's the only, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, we talked about it before. It's the only book about McNeil Island, which is pretty notorious around here and stuff. Uh, yeah, everyone has something to say about it. So, yeah, it's always easy to talk about it with people. So, yeah, it's a great book. Yeah. Um. So let's see, and I have a piece in um, the latest Not My Small Diary. Um, and I think, do you do too, Roberta? Yeah, I do. Okay. So, so this is new and it's great. Um, and then my personal stuff, I've got an ongoing series, Iron Scars, which is about a bunch of adopted kids who live on an island. Um, so that's kind of like my childhood, kids on an island. Um, but then they get into a fight with witches and fairies. So that's the fun stuff. Nice. Uh, <laughs> and then I just put out this year uh, the 20, no, not 20th, 10th anniversary edition of um, my Ignatz Award winning, winning comic, Woman King. So I got to put a shiny sticker on it. Um, and these ones you can get from Emerald City Distro, and I think they distro to Destiny City Comics. Indeed. Yeah, for sure. That's awesome. Um, how about you, Roberta? Yeah. Uh, any big things to plug or what's out there for you? I don't have anything really new. I mean, I've got my True Cat Tunes book, which are, that's, I think, the most recent, like, book book. That's from 2014. And um, last time I saw her, she drew me a picture of my cat. I <laughs> <Yes>. did. <laughs> yeah. She had her draw the store cat Herbert, too. Yeah, definitely. Uh... <laughs> you order one from me, I will draw your cat in it. That's um, awesome. And I'm not sure if it's on <laughs> I've got a website, robertagregory.com, which is easy because it's my name. The bad thing is it's this obsolete Apple software for webs that I can't update. So <laughs> it's like, you know, eight years old or whatever. But um, you, the, you can still order comics, like the PayPal works. So you can okay. either order comics or just pop me a line and say, hey, I want a cat tunes and here's my cat. So, yeah, I'm hoping... I'm hoping to have something maybe by 2021 or whatever, a new book, but I'm around. Yeah. I mean, I figure if anybody wants to find my stuff, just track me down. I've got back issues of Dottie Bits. I've got bitchy collections and just look me up and, you know, you can get stuff from me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, um, well, um, one book that we sold a lot, even though it's kind of like one of the bigger kind of archive collections is that complete women's comics collection. Uh, that Fanographics put out. Oh, that, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, usually high price tag books, you know, they can be hard to sell, but that one, that one stayed pretty popular and stuff. So, yeah, that's, a, and I don't know if that's still easy to get. Uh, I believe, believe you can and stuff, but yeah, that's a, that's an option if you're looking to add something pretty cool. They so stuff. need to do that with gay comics. I mean, that would just be awesome. Like oh, the, yeah. The, <laughs> <laughs> if anybody's doing it, but, you know, I've got some stories in there that weren't all that bad. So that might end up in this collection that i'm not sure i'm doing <laughs> but yeah. like i say it's it'll happen that's awesome yeah. uh how about you dana you, uh, do you want to uh plug those books again yeah, yeah i plugged some stuff at the beginning but i'm gonna re-plug i'm not a girl by maddox lines and jessica verity and illustrated by and uh this comes out on tuesday and i hope that it is i hope that it is a helpful to the, the trans children of the world and people who love them um, February, Phoebe and her unicorn book 12, virtual unicorn experience will be coming out. 12. How do I have 12 books? That's amazing. Um, this, yeah. is a, this is still the current one for now, book 11. Um, yeah, this, I, have, I have 12 Phoebe and her unicorn books now. So um, by really any of them, I get paid the same. 
Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. That's yeah. not true. I I get more money, I think, if you buy book one because I won that book contract in a contest and I get a pretty sweet royalty right off of it. Oh, so nice. buy Phoebe and your unicorn book one, buy like 30 of it. Yeah. <laughs> It'll come in handy. Yeah, everyone's going to want that for uh, holidays, bar mitzvahs, you know. Uh <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The holiday season is when my sales numbers are the highest, which is probably for most authors, I, I guess. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, well, uh, very cool. Yeah, uh, well, thank you very much for uh, taking the time to uh, chat today. Um, I think that's all the questions we had as far as uh, from the chat and everything. Um, thank you all for watching. And uh, be sure to uh, put in orders at Destiny City Comics and your local comic shop. Uh, thank you. Yeah, all right. Have a great day. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Michael. Yes. Thank you. This was great. <laughs> Good to see everybody. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Uh, stay safe, everyone. Yeah.